It's a dry lake, but it's not a salt lake. So we've we've come across there, and we're now there on the Western Beach Campground. So we go up and up and around the lake, and then down there to Rainbow, and then we make our way through Whipperfield, and then end up back in Underball again, <laughs> again, and then check out somewhere, somewhere up the river. At this point we left Western Beach Campground and headed north, driving up the centre of the lake. This was made much easier by the fact that it hadn't been filled since the 1970s and hadn't had any inflow since 1996. In 2011 it was thought that it might see some inflow and could possibly fill, but this never ended up happening. Due to the lower levels of salinity in the area, during this dry phase vegetation has been creeping in from what was formerly the banks of the lake. That is the only time I've ever seen a sign that says wet weather only. We headed further round the lake to the OTIT campground. Little is known about why exactly the area is named this, but it's believed to be an abbreviation of Otaheat, a former name for Tahiti. If or why it's named after that, nobody knows. It's not a very deep well. It doesn't have a lot of water either. And then we headed south to Rainbow for fuel and a few supplies, stopping to check out some silo art on the way. The rainbow, big rainbow. That's the old style park note. I think this one's a lot smaller than actual size actually. It's the, it's the small rainbow. And then we reached the south side of Whipperfeld National Park. Yeah, we're not going to do the full 7k in the middle of the day. Okay, that's about enough of that. We bailed out of that one as it was just too hot to walk through deep sand in a desert. Finding a walk that featured a little more shade, we decided to do that one instead. Modifying the route a little to do two walks in one. Windmill was erected in the park in 1961 to provide water from wildlife, which is no longer regarded as appropriate park management. Well, it's your choice. Swarms of feral bees or dying of dehydration. Which one will it be? The secret. There's lots of that. You're the worst. What? Cutting it like that. Or is that better? Mm -hmm. Ah, I think it's uh, hotter in here than outside. So that is a stump jump plow. If it hits a stump, it just jumps over it. Uh, the modern incarnation has a bit of fencing wire holding the whole lot together. Stuff from a well, while a very short man uh, watches on. So the Cameron brothers from Dimbola farmed Wonga Lake Station and the adjacent Naipo property between 1874 and 1880. 
1874, Martin Cameron's wife Jane gave birth to twins. The baby boy Donald died when he was only seven days old. The other baby, Jane Stoddart, survived her brother and spent her early years at Wonga Lake Station. You know, I could really have ascended that hill a lot slower. Subtract minutes. So, December, where are we, like 29th? Subtract two minutes. Subtract two minutes. I suspect someone had turned that sundial an hour in the wrong direction for daylight savings. I couldn't get the right time out of it. Once again, the area is so flat that it really doesn't take a big hill to see a long way. Mally fell. Riverfield National Park is This is bloody hot. After nearly barbecuing my hand on the information display, I can tell you that this is a Mellifow nest. The next part of the walk takes you around some grassland with all the flora labelled by species. At this point, the four-wheel drive fun begins again, and we plotted our way through the north of the that park. That should do it. Well, here we are again. The drive up to the north part of the park, unsurprisingly, was very similar to Big Desert, and also the western part of the park via Milmed Rock Track. We got to the closest track to the northern remote camping area, and I went off to go and find the campsite. All right, I guess this thing. Campsite reconnaissance completed, we then headed north to Casuarina camping area to check that one out, stopping to have a break. We headed on towards the Wirringuin Plain, a dry lake. This is the Snowdrift Picnic and Camping Area, so named because the giant sand dune resembles a snowdrift. Okay, but it's sand, not snow, there's still a bit of a difference. I wondered why this track came in via one direction then suddenly turned out to another in a near hairpin, and the answer is that it goes to a disused bore. Next up was O'Sullivan's Lookout, another lookout on top of a hill. Well, that's generally where they're found. The map shows this one as a loop, but the other half of the loop is quite indistinct. Careful attention to flagging tape is required. Heading further up to find some sort of big red gum. That's a pretty big river red gum, but I am going to get out of here before it drops a branch on me. A bit more sand, some plains, one last deep sand section, and then we're out of the park and it's time to pump up tyres before we hit the bitumen. And upon reaching Oyen, follow signs for Mildura. But before reaching Mildura, we stopped in Red Cliffs to take a look at Big Lizzy. Now a lot of regional Australian towns have, and are indeed famous for their big something or other, 
but this one's no giant fiberglass replica of a piece of fruit. It's the world's largest tractor and it was built to work. Did it? Well, that's another story that could take up an entire video of its own, which is what I'm going to do. At this point we were well aware of the fading light and we needed to find camp pretty soon. We headed west down the Sturt Highway towards around Lock 9 on the Murray, then planning to head north and grab the first camp spot on the river we saw. Finding the first three occupied, we put one space between us and the others and picked the fifth one. The last remnants of sunlight disappeared pretty soon after we got to camp, so dinner was made in the dark. Evaluation of the campsite the following morning revealed that we were pretty good at finding a good spot. Our plan for today was pretty simple. Head to Mildura, wash the car, find something to do until 2pm, then check into a service department and wash ourselves and all of our clothing before heading to Adelaide to see family. First up, washing the car. Need to remove the antennas, but the CB antenna is much harder to remove, although it's lost its end cap so now I have to tape it up. Next up, after the automated car wash, attack all the things with the high pressure hose to get all the sand and dirt out from where it shouldn't be. Next part of the plan involved going somewhere called the Red Cliffs Lookout. I don't know what it is. I literally don't know. Okay, so it's a... Uh... They'd be pretty ahead of their time if they had car parks back then. I don't think cars were really a thing at the time. It's 60 if you're on the correct side of the road, 40 if you're not. And then a pump station that holds Mildura's original water pump. Sadly closed at the time. Yeah, funny looking campsite you might say. Well, it's the last day. We're heading on to Adelaide to see family. And, uh, well, figured it might be a good idea to have a shower first. Just saying. And welcome to SA. SA mode activated. And that's it for our little adventure. Stay tuned for a video on Big Lizzie, a few videos on our entire setup, and whatever else we get up to after this. Subscribe if you haven't already.